I'm looking for the, all right, thank you. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, we welcome those tuned in by live stream. We're doing more than talking about prayer. We're going to, well, we already got into a lot of it. So I just want to mention to those that are by live stream, if it's at all possible, and I'm 90% sure it is, be here in the house because you just missed a whole bunch. God just poured out his spirit. Amen, church. He just poured out his spirit. At least I felt it. And we're on a journey and we're, we're climbing these mountains. This is what it feels like to climb the mountain, come up to the higher places of God. So in case you missed it last time, I, I recommended this book, Prayers That Avail Much. This is the special edition. I could pass it around if you'd like to look at it. It actually has three volumes in one. If you don't know how to pray, there's a page for everything in your family, how to pray for your spouse, how to pray for your kids. The, the scriptures are listed in there. You could read it word for word and insert, you know, page 69, vision for a church. Father, name of Jesus, uh, we come to your presence thanking you for name of church. You have called us to be saints in the city and around the world. We lift our voice. So you could read it word for word, and these are scriptural prayers. And if you want, really want to kick it up to the next level, I went back to my Bible college textbooks, the prayer study course by the late Kenneth E. Hagan. This has, if you see the orange inside there, these are my notes uh, from Bible college. And it describes, Dad Hagen gives his testimony, how he obtained victory in the spirit, uh, how to deal with faith and unbelief, and how to hook up with other people, uh, prayer examples throughout the word of God. Uh, there's a lot to it, and there are questions in there. I highly recommend that study course. See, that's the difference between being a believer and a disciple. A disciple is a disciplined one, a learned one. You're going to take time out of every day and increase in God. <clears throat> Are you with me? i got to stop saying that. I've been watching Rodney Howard Brown and, and other folk as well. I want to start by saying this. Uh, this segment, okay, last week we prayed for our government, and we're going to continue to do that. Let's not be segmented, and men are especially bad about that. Uh, we, we put things in boxes. We have our work box, our family box, and things like that, maybe our church box. Let's not just take what was taught last week and then just move on to something else. This is incremental. So we're still praying because we're in an election cycle. And part of what I'm going to do today is going to be part teaching and part praying. I'm just going to say something, then we're going to do it. Okay, just keep saying amen. It makes me feel better. So please write this down. I don't know if I have a slide for it. Prayer begins at home. Amen. Very, very simple. Prayer begins at home. Um, you just have to bear with me. <clears throat> As we said last week, uh, prayer invites God's presence. So if you're praying at home, guess what's going to happen? You're inviting God's presence into your house. I believe when people walk by, and I pray that over our house, that when people even walk by, walking their dogs, they're going to feel the presence of God. Amen. They're going to feel peace. God's going to speak to them. There could be an anointing on your entire property. See, back in the day, we used to walk the property lines and just speak the word of God over it. If you have a house that hasn't been uh, officially blessed, you could do it yourself. You could get some oil like we have, or you could lay your hands over the, the doorpost or the doorway and speak the word of God over your house if you'd like for Pastor and I to come by, and we could do that. We have uh, dedicated houses unto the Lord, especially if you bought uh, a used house. You don't know what took place there before, and there could be residual uh, familiar spirits and stuff like that. Well, Jan bought our house. I, it, it's blessed. <laughs> I can't tell you some stories. That house used to be a church, by the way. It used to be a general store. It used to be way, way back in the day. Post and beam construction. So it invites God's presence. It prepares God's people. And it activates God's power. So we're looking at intercession to where we pray for another. All right? We're going to pray for another. We're going to pray for each other. So let's look at... So the... Uh, <clears throat> The layout I'm going to give you, we're going to start with spouses, 
So whether this applies to you or not, you could even believe God for a spouse. And then we're going to pray for children. Do you, do you think our kids need prayer today? How many would want to be a kid today? I didn't think so. So let's begin with husbands and wives. Ephesians 5, 21, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. And further submit to one another. Everyone say out one another. Out of reverence for Christ. So as we submit to God, we submit one to another. So how do we do that? We pray for one another. Mama is not to be the only prayer in the house. And everyone else ride on her coattails. So I'm going to speak to husbands because I is one. I'm going to speak to daddies because I is one of those as well. You are the priest of the house. I'm, I'm using the model of the nuclear family as a model for this. If you're a single person, you pray for yourself and you can pray for other folks as well. Uh, moving down to verse 25, <clears throat> excuse me. For husbands, this means love your wives. Don't take this the wrong way, but if you love your wife, would you not pray for her? Speak the word of God and bless her. What does it mean to bless? Simply to say good things about her. More than you look awesome today as usual. Right, husbands? Yeah. That's got awfully quiet in here. I mean, that you would pray for her. You would speak the word of God over her and bless her. <clears throat> Invite God in a strong way. And the same thing for wives for husbands. This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Well, use him as our example. Is he praying for us? He is our head intercessor. He's praying for his bride, which is the body of Christ. He gave up his life for her. Yeah. Is there things that, her husband, that husbands need to give up for their wives? Well, I golf on Saturday. Well, if your wife needs you, then maybe you need to lay down that part of your life. And no one said amen. I think at least the wives would have said something. I'm trying to help you. Verse 26, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of what? God's word. You speak God's word. I don't know what to say. We'll then get these books. Come meet with your pastors and we'll, we'll teach and train you. It's not hard. Don't leave the house of a morning without blessing each other. <laughs> Am I in the right church? <laughs> It'll make the whole difference. Verse 27, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. So, for example, uh, husbands, let's take, for example, you're praying for your wife. What would you pray for? I thought it'd get kind of quiet on that. What would you pray for? Someone say it. Life, health, and what is that? Life health, Life, health, and strength. And then hopefully you'd have a scripture for that, but that's, Doc is right. We speak blessings over her, health and peace. If she's going through something, you lift that up before the Lord. If she has a question, that God would show her the answer. If she's battling a physical condition, then you would lift that up as well, right? You would just speak in general. You're going to have an awesome day because God loves you. Speak health and blessings over her. I speak spiritual blessings over her that she's going to hear from God. And don't be intimidated by this stuff. I learned this through 20, 30, 40, how many years we've been married? 50 years? That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> but we learn as we go. We learn as we go. Before I would leave the house to go to work, the way that we prayed, we'd hold each other, and as we pray, we're, we're speaking in the other person's ear. A couple times we modeled that up here on, on the stage. You don't have to, to do that. Sometimes if she leaves for work before I do, I'm still in the bed, so she prays for me, so I don't have to get up. But you could do things like that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thought I was in the wrong there for a minute. But speak the Word of God over each other, things that are holy and righteous and true, things that are uplifting, Praise God that she's going to have an awesome day. Something good, good is going to happen to her. We, we borrow these things from Joyce Meyer and different folk we pick up along the way. That the rest of her life would be the best of her life. Speak Psalms 91. That God would show his strength, power, and glory over her. Amen. Amen. With long life, his satisfier, and show her his salvation. That no weapon formed against her will ever prosper. So these are the types of things that you could pray over one another. Imagine what kind of day you'd have. Don't you feel sad for those 
uh, that have no prayer and they're just out there at the whim of the enemy and circumstances of life. When you begin to pray, you dictate the circumstances. You don't have a good day. You make a good day. You shove the enemy out of the way. You speak God's blessings. Hallelujah. Even if they did wake up on the the wrong side of the bed or whatnot, they, they make a good day out of that. What about the wife praying over her husband? I'm assuming that he's going away to work. I'm just using it as an example. Uh, the hazards that he may face, you know, the coal miners, uh, whatever the professions you have that may be exposed to chemicals or whatnot, even just getting to work, traveling safety. If you're going to drive these highways, you best better be prayed up. Sometimes they deal with a bad work environment, low morale. The boss is cranky. The, uh, the employees, they're gossiping and they're, they're lazy or whatnot. And the, the workload is not fair. Because if you're a child of God, you're probably going to bear more of, bear more of your uh, share of the load. All types of interactions. There, there's fooling around in, in adultery and, and people making passes at one another, the, the secretary or whatever. Those that go on business trips. Uh, that they would flourish in those types of things, uh, even as they travel, uh, getting on planes and different things like that. Speaking favor over them, speaking promotion and blessings. They'd have witty ideas. So it just goes on and on. There's all kinds of things. Hallelujah. That they'd be uh, escalate and climb that ladder of success, be the head and not the tail. So what do we do? As, a, as an example, we pray for our marriage using God's blessings. Let's go all the way back to Genesis because we believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. We're made in God's image. Your marriage is made in God's image. Genesis 1.27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So our marriage is made in the image of God. So God is at peace. He's in love. Amen. He's looking out for our best interest. So that's how we treat our spouse. So we will, since we're made in the image of God, we need to use our God-given likeness to represent the Lord clearly in our marriage. That should be a high prayer for all of us, that our marriage reflects Jesus in the church. That when people see our marriage, they're drawn to Jesus. So the very next verse says that we rule in God's stead. We're made in God's image, if you're taking notes, and we rule in God's stead. Verse 28 says, Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Amen. Fruitfulness, multiplication, promotion, favor, increase. Hallelujah, because what's on the head will flow down. So if whoever is the head of that house, they are fruitful and they flourish, that also has that trickle-down effect. Can you say amen? amen? You want your kids to be blessed, and your kids will mimic what they see typically. I just love that little uh, music video about me and my house. So I'd like to give you a homework assignment that I want every family to sing your own version of that, record it on video, we'll put it on screen next Sunday, as for me and my house. Our marriage is blessed by the Word of God, and we will use our God-given authority to rule as kings. Amen. Here's one of the scriptures that you may want to write down, Ecclesiastes 4.12, that says the threefold cord is not quickly broken. So who's the third cord but other than Jesus himself? How many marriages are here today only because of the grace of God? He being that third cord, I thank God for that. Jesus would be the center of our marriage. Did that help anyone today for, as far as praying for spouses? Okay, let's move on to our children. Oh, God, our children need prayer. Let me just look at a couple things in here. I gave some praise reports before church of how uh, there was a high school uh, football coach who was fired for praying, kneeling. Uh, He got his job back. Amen. The court threw it out. Franklin Graham was canceled in in Scotland because they were concerned about what he might say about different community groups. Uh, The court threw that out. So God is on the move. I still have another uh, sample ballot here if you haven't voted early already. 
Uh, and I did thank the Lord. There was another praise report, West Virginia being the second in the union to have uh, pro-life legislation uh, that was enacted at the very moment that Roe versus Wade was, uh, was overturned. Okay, and they do have exceptions for the life of the mother and uh, things of that nature. I believe rape and incest as well. Here's another stat just to give you an idea of the urgency and the need for prayer. So we're, we, let's not take an attitude that we're going to do things because we're supposed to or because the preacher told me. This is a dire need. And I thank God that we have the avenue of prayer. Eight out of ten teenagers expect to cohabitate. None of us want that in our family, amen? Uh, The different things that children are facing these days, uh, sexually explicit books in schools and in libraries. I've seen a couple uh, snippets on YouTube to where parents, and I didn't listen to them, but they were actually reading out loud to the school board the books that were found in their library, and the board didn't even want to hear it. They shut them down, but yet it was okay for the kids to see that. Uh, Our kids need to be protected in the schoolroom. Our kids need to be protected in the locker room. Our kids need to be protected in the bathroom, in every room. They need to be protected from any type of mentality that is against the Word of God, that says that we're not created, that we're just random chance, that we're an animal. Uh, Even with regard to race, as far as critical race, we are all the critical race in God, is how I see that. We're all precious in His sight. And anything that would try to pit one group of people against another, it just needs to go. Can you say amen to that? Because there's just such division in our land. Uh, Things, they're just being weaponized, and even the curriculums and things of that nature. There's other things I'm just going to skip over. They're even trying to weaponize the VA to provide abortions and things like that. So I don't want to spend a long time on that. We covered... A lot of that. So in focusing on our children, this is the awesome privilege that parents pray for their children because no prayer can take the place of a parent. Amen. They're dependent upon you. Dads, I'm using, a, they're the priest of the home, so we are to use our privilege to bless our families. It's a privilege and an honor to bless our families. How precious it is to lay hands on our children, even while they're sleeping. How many have done that? You've, you've, you've snuck in and you've laid that hand on them and you've whispered a prayer or whatnot. Or you put a prayer cloth or something under their pillow, stuff they didn't know. No prayer can take the place of a parent. Dads are the priests of the home, so use your privilege to bless your family. So how do we do this? How do we intercede for our children? Well, one example is like Job. I know he's not the perfect example, but... We really don't find that many parental blessings other than on their deathbed for children. So I want to use Job as just a quick example. What did Job pray? He prayed for protection for his children. He interceded for forgiveness in case they did something wrong. He interceded that his children be in right standing with the Lord. Especially those things that might have been committed in ignorance. Jesus prayed that from the cross. God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Bible says that Job was blameless, he walked in integrity, he feared God, and he stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. We're only going to look at uh, one scripture, verse 5, chapter 1. His children had a celebration, and it says in verse 5, when these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. That's the power of parents, you could purify your children. He would get up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings. Uh, For each of them, for Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Now, some people say, well, he did that out of fear. I'm not here to dispute that. But I believe his heart was for his children. So how do we do this for our children? How do we pray for protection for them? Here's some examples, and I'm going to turn this into a, a mini prayer session so you can agree with me. That we protect our children with a firewall of protection of the Word of God. Can you say amen? That we surround our children with a hedge of protection that the enemy cannot penetrate. That the influence of the ungodly will be rendered null and void in my children's lives. 
that the conviction and even the fear of the Lord will grip those who would even try to bring harm to them or cause them to stumble in any way, shape, or form. And that we plead the precious blood of Jesus over them. Hallelujah. That they will also, this kind of gets in the prayer of Jesus, they will have favor with the right people. They're going to have godly friends. Amen. Amen. Uh, they will be protected from the wrong people, protected from bad influences. They'll be protected from ungodly sources that would try to move them away from their faith in God. In other words, our children will not be a statistic. Even those that go to college, they will not be a statistic that within two weeks, even those that have been raised up in churches and in, the, in godly homes, that they walk away from God within the first few weeks because they become so indoctrinated with the things of this world. It will not touch our children. They'll stand strong. I can testify to that because I walked through that my own self. I sat in a sociology class where this professor had an axe to grind big time against uh, especially Christianity, and I sat there as an Army veteran. I was recently discharged. I was like, I did not defend my country to hear someone spew these, this type of thing when I'm paying their salary. So it went on day after day for about two weeks. I finally had it up to here. So I confronted the professor after class, and I basically asked, you know, what's up with that? And I literally asked him, I said, you have some kind of ax to grind against Christianity. And I was sitting there with a church members that I was attending with at that time, and I noticed that none of them said anything. And I think we need to be careful of that, that we just don't want to duck our heads down and tuck our tails in, just want to get through. I don't want any drama. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want any repercussion. Just whatever. Just give me my grade and let me move on. I don't think that's the best attitude to take. And that was back in the 1990s. So just imagine what it's like today. And so uh, apparently he was surprised and kind of shocked that someone would actually have any pushback or something to say. So he begins to make excuses and whatnot and backpedal and, and redirect and things like that. That wasn't acceptable to me because I heard you day after day, hour after hour berating. What does that have to do with sociology? It's like, so he was using his desk as a bully pulpit. Isn't it funny how there's double standards in the world that if a preacher were to say the same thing as that guy said, they'd be run out of town on a rail. But yet people pay thousands of dollars and voluntarily sit under that and will repeat what they say on a test that they can get out of there. And so he's tried to excuse himself. I followed him down the hallway. And then he went to another building. I followed him across campus. And we were having this, this discussion. He knew that he wasn't going to shake me. He went to the next building down in the basement. I followed him there. I think he just ducked into a classroom just to get away from me. <laughs> I didn't threaten him. I just peppered him with questions. What is, what's up with this? What did you mean by that? Why did you say this? Where are you coming from? What does this have to do with this class? Guess what happened in the next class? I didn't hear any more about it. There was change because one person stood up. Maybe it took me going overseas and missing my home and missing my country, missing my family to open my eyes. I think every American needs to spend time overseas doing something, missionary work, military or something. You will kiss the ground when you come back. At least you would want to. So there ought to be a Holy Ghost fire in us as parents that my children are not going to inherit some jacked up nation that's ripped apart at the seams. Confusion and godlessness. Don't you want your children to have it better than you? Let's take our opportunity, our God-given privilege, speak blessings over them. We pray that they have godly relationships. You wonder how many God actually people, students, actually believe God. How many friends they could actually have to open up and have a godly conversation with. And we also pray protection over them, body, soul, and spirit. That their minds are protected. That their emotions are protected. That they're not intimidated. These types of things. As I said, my children will not become a statistic 
My children will not become confused as to who they are. My children shall succeed in everything that they set their hands to. So we learned a little bit from Job. Now let's pray for our children like Jesus did. Jesus blessed the children. Matthew 19, 13, please. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus. I said they brought their children to Jesus. It's a beautiful thing when parents dedicate their children to the Lord. So Jesus could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus says, let the children come unto me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. We had never officially inscribed this verse, but this is basically what we had built Solid Rock Daycare about. Matthew 19 and 14, let the children come unto him, for such is the kingdom of God. I love praising and worshiping the Lord with those little two-year-olds and three-year-olds. There's no cynicism. There's no racism. There's Chinese kids. There's white kids. There's brown kids. There's all different types. Right here in West by God, Virginia, how beautiful that is. And I see just a microcosm of the kingdom of God. They're playing together. They're sharing. Sometimes they, they'll act up, but it's not based on the things that we think of. It's just plain old selfishness. doesn't matter who you are. I want that toy. <laughs> it's amazing how they want every toy. But they quickly forget about things. I'm so convicted by that. How many years we've carried grudges and hurts and things like that and licking wounds and whatnot. Such is the kingdom of heaven. And we want that protected, don't we? We don't want them to grow up jaded and cynical. He placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. But Pastor, you mean I need to lay hands on my kids? If we follow the pattern of Jesus... I still remember when my Joseph, I think it was maybe eight years old, when we were in the storefront. It wasn't asked of me. There was something going on in that service. But I just wanted to bring him to the front, not to dedicate him to the Lord, because he already was, but just to lay hands on him. And I, I prophesied a, a warrior spirit into him that day, that he would stand strong and I anointed, I laid my hands on his hands, and I got, or on his head. Then I got on my knees, I laid my hands on his feet, that they would walk in the path of God. I laid my hands on his hand, that they would do the work of the Lord. That was 19, what, 96 or something like that. I don't see the fullness of that today, being he's almost 40 now. But he says he believes, and so I still hold on to Joshua 24, as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. And now he has his own children and one of his sons wearing a cross that he went and bought with his own money, going to probably in Sunday school right now, learning about the things. So we pick up the phone. I said, what, what did the priest say today? What did you learn? Oh, we learned about John the Baptist. or so we learned about uh, whatever the last thing was. And we discussed the word of God. How, how awesome that is. We talk about his ball games and things like that. So that's part of it. But we don't shirk around, you know, the J word, Jesus, or church, or things like that. That We want him to feel comfortable. That's just as much a part of his life as school and things like that. And we also, even as grandparents, face the challenge of, uh, wasn't so much a teacher, but it was the aftercare supervisor that was talking about evolution and things like that, and how that started to confuse, at that point, a nine-year-old mind. It's taught one way, Pat, Pat, and Grandma, priest, the Bible, Adam and Eve, and now we're saying that this other person, so that confusion, authority against authority, who's right? I don't want to disrespect either one, but yet i got to make a decision. I can't, I can't straddle that. So we reassure him, God's word is true. Amen. God loves us all including the people we don't understand, including the people that we completely disagree with. God loves them. Amen. And we just instill that foundation. And by the time we hang up, it's like, thanks, I got it. Hallelujah. Yes, lay your hands on your kids. You can bring them up here, and we'll all participate with you. We'll, we'll pray with you. That is awesome. 
even with altar calls, God spoke to us years ago. He says, do not neglect the ministry of laying on of hands. That we could speak and pray for people, but lay your hands on them. It's a point of contact. It's, it's not a formality. It is a point of contact. There's the anointing of God that is on you and only you as a parent that is being transmitted to your kids. So when you put them on that big yellow bus, you know that God's got them. Hallelujah. They're already blessed. They're already anointed. The hands are already upon them. They're already sealed unto God. So you could pray like Jesus, that my children will remain steadfast in the faith. My children will be a godly example to their neighbors, to their school. Evil's not going to influence them. They're going to influence the school. Not saying all schools are evil, but there is a lot of evil in schools. You know, when you take prayer out of an institution, you're left a huge vacuum. They're going to be a godly example for their classmates and their teachers. How about the blessings of God flowing up and flowing out? Their activity groups, including sports and, and whatnot. How about those of us that are children, we pray for our parents, that our kids pray for us. That is awesome to hear children pray for their parents. So even those of us that are adults, we can still pray for our parents. You can send blessings up the family tree. Yes, there are things from Abraham that come down, but you could also bless them. Speak the word of God over your parents. If they don't know the Lord, declare that they will know the Lord. God did it for my dad. He reaffirmed his faith just days before he passed away. Did the same thing for Miss Jan. Prayed for a long time, decades. Sometimes you saw things go backwards. I tell you, God is faithful. God is faithful. So whether they're saved or not, speak blessings over them. Psalms 91, with long life, God will satisfy them and show him salvation. In my own prayer time, God reminded me of Psalms 91. He says, I showed your dad my salvation. He's with me now. I showed him my salvation. I saved him. I saw the change in his life. I won't say the, the things. I'm... Anyways, we pray for our siblings as well. That your children, that they pray for their brothers and sisters. Not just always receiving from moms and dads. We're talking about the family unit. Pray for your brothers and your sisters, the ones that are serving God. You Maybe you don't know where they are. You still pray them. God knows where they are. He knows what they're going through. He knows what they need. Intercede for your siblings. So we cover our immediate family to our extended family. Lord, we lift up our parents in Jesus' name. We do pray for them. We speak blessings over them in Jesus' name. We thank you that every single one of them, they're going to be in heaven. And they're going to fulfill as much as they can their call while they're here. We also pray for our siblings. We pray for our, our natural, our adopted, half-brothers, sisters, whoever they may be, Lord. We speak blessings over them. And even that their children. As for me and my house, we just extend our tent pegs all over our in-laws, our cousins, our aunts, uncles, Father God, hallelujah, our brothers, sisters, their children, and their children's children as well. This is called household salvation. I want to give you some encouragement from Acts 16. This is the story of the Philippian jailer. We talked about that during United Prayer. But this is the effect of United Prayer was household salvation. So after the jailer came to Jesus, uh, came to give his heart to the Lord, verse 31, the jailer is before Paul the Apostle. These are the folks that will come to you and say that they're sorry for what they did to you. He says, what must I do to be saved? Paul said in verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone, say everyone, in your house. Not two-thirds. Well, even what they call the black sheep, everyone, the hard case, the runaway will be saved. Let's say this together. Everyone in my house shall be saved and stay saved. 
In other words, the backslidden will return to their first love of Jesus. None of my, let's say this together, none of my family will miss the rapture. Lord, we pray that you put people in their path to speak truth to their hearts that they would receive from. The irony that a lot of us face is that we're praying for our family, but because there's so much familiarity that they really don't want to listen to us like they would their buddy down the street. So what we do, in case they won't listen to us fully, that God will put people in their path. I remember talking to my dad. uh, Someone in the neighborhood had passed away. So I used that as a springboard for the gospel. I said, boy, it really makes you think about eternity. And uh, we were standing in the garage. See, I don't do this when there's 20 people around. I think there's some wisdom in that. Because just the awkwardness, even if they do want to talk about it, if we don't use wisdom, the awkwardness will drive that out. So it's just him, he and I, I said, uh, I said, are you ready? And he said, I hope so. And I was like, well, that's about 50%. What do you do with that? So I briefly explained, well, if we believe in Jesus as the Son of God, we put our faith in him, and I kept it within 10 seconds which I believe is also wisdom. I didn't use that to pull out a 15-point sermon and be there for an hour and a half. But we continue to pray that for our parents, even our children, that God would put people in their path that they would listen to. There's people they have a connection with, they have a rapport with. That they, If they say something, they'll be like, you know, I'm really going to take that and think about that. So time went on, and... My dad took a liking to Pastor Lydia, a a real good liking. There's four of his kids, but he liked her. So I dubbed her number one son. So whenever I wanted something, I'd ask her. (laughs) And there was a particular night he he couldn't be alone, so she stayed there and kept an eye on. She's uh, retired or has many years of life, licensed practical nurse and helped him medically. So, and I guess before they went to bed, he was talking about his uh, second wife who had recently gone to be with the Lord. He says, do you think she's in heaven? And so they began to, do I have this right? And she began to talk about the things of God and of heaven. So she asked him, are you ready? And so one thing led to another, and she led him into the sinner's prayer in his house by themselves. Was it like 10, 11 o'clock at night or something like that? Hallelujah. I say God is faithful. Almost 90 years old. I said God is faithful. See, some of you haven't walked through that. You have no frame of reference, but I tell you, God is faithful. You don't know what it is to stand for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You know, the older the folks get, you don't know when day is their last. One visit is going to be your last. I tell you, God is faithful. Amen. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can send the blessings of God up the family tree. Everyone in your household. Not only was the Philippians house saved, but the Philippian church was birthed. As a result of that, let's go down to the very next verse. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all those who lived in his household, his wife, his kids. How many times you find in the word of God that what happens to daddy, it gets all over the family. That's why we need to pray more men into the church. That men learn how to be men. Real men worship the Lord. Real men serve God. I don't say that with religious arrogance. I'm saying that's why we were made and to lead our families. Okay, verse 33. Even at that hour of the night, they were singing praise at midnight. So this is in the a.m. The jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Oh, God, I pray there become a healing to those who have spewed out hurtful words. And lashed out at people. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. They had a salvation call. They had church service. They had a baptismal service probably 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. 
I tell you, when God comes to town, it doesn't matter what time it is. It's always time for salvation. Today is the day of salvation. He brought them, in verse 34, into his house, set a meal before them. I tell you, that is revival. And he is an entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. I don't think the kids were believing in God because dad said, you know, you're going to bow the knee there, boy. They saw such a change in their dad. They said, I, I got to have me that. I want to be like my daddy. You know, the greatest, uh, it's my Father's Day sermon, but the greatest compliment you ever get is like you act just like your father. That's the greatest compliment you'll ever get. You act like your father. You sound just like your father. You look like your father. You respond just like your father. I say, thank you, Jesus. He his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Let's say this together. Our family is united in God. Our family will serve the Lord all of our days. We will serve the Lord willingly from a grateful heart with a spirit of joy and with gladness. And we also call on those that are not saved because family members may be lost, but they're still family. I said they're still family. If you've heard the testimony of Joyce Meyer, she had, uh, I think her brother was wayward and off and just, but he came into the fold. Her dad, and you've heard her testimony about her dad bazillions of times. He came into the fold. She baptized it and her mom, her whole household. God is faithful. God took a horrendous and hideous nightmarish situation, healed her and healed the whole family. So we pray for our extended family. That's why I leave with Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my family, my immediate family, my church family, my extended family, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Did you get anything out of this? We're going to go ahead and sign off at this point. Father God, we thank you for your word.